Sebastian went on to give us a talk about, you know, how to build relationships, but how can you even keep relations if you cannot, you know, crack a case? So creativity uh, really is a key component uh, in problem solvers when you're really trying to kind of navigate through these cases to make sure that you can put yourself at the forefront with your um, while competing with other companies to really kind of impress your clients, retain your clients, and build a solid relationship. So we wanted to get uh, the perspectives from the Boston Consulting Group, and we have Janice Yao here to give us um, that sort of a perspective as to how we can really incorporate our creativity when we are solving casework. And um, Janice had uh, completed a dual degree from Singapore Management University. She completed a uh, BBM and BSc in economics and finance. Uh, then she also joined uh, BSc, uh, sorry, BCG, uh, pardon me, uh, in uh, 2008. And then she, then she went on to work for uh, Starwoods Hotel. And then she again joined back BCG as a project leader in 2014. And she's still currently a project leader. So let's hear back, uh, well, let's welcome Janice here and hear from her. Thanks for the introduction, Labiba. So I thought what we could do today is maybe keep this a little more interactive versus just you know a typical recruiting talk. So I know a lot of people have questions about you know what's consulting all about. And the truth is, consulting is a very personal experience. Everyone in BCG takes away a different piece of what consulting might look like. So I thought what we can do is one, let's share my experience of my time at BCG, how I felt like I've grown, what's my perspective on it. And then we can go into a little bit of a flavor around you know, what casebook is like. And I can talk a little bit about what I've been doing, mainly in the TMT world, which is technology, media, and telecommunications, which is very different from my background. I have no idea about this industry before I worked at BCG. So I thought that might be a good translation to you guys, because you know, the business world is very foreign to you, similarly how you know, the business world is familiar to me, but like the TMT world is completely foreign. So how would you like thrive in an environment like this? How would you cope? How would BCG help you in that case? So that's the sub beast. And then the third one, if you would indulge me, is something that I'm just really passionate about. And it's about women at BCG. And we can touch a little bit on that. And the way I thought we could do this is to kind of have three segments of kind of maybe me talking for five to 10 minutes. We could open up and have a little bit of dialogue about what we talked about. And then we kind of move on from there. Sounds good? Perfect. So my experience at BCG, so Labiba touched on the fact that I joined BCG straight out of business school, so I was kind of like this person on your right-hand side over here. Thought I knew what consulting was all about, but in truth, I had no idea. I had all these fanciful ideas about what it was, what I needed to do. And fast forward to where I am today. I'm a project leader where I'm helping lead a team, I'm helping developing people, and helping shape clients and their strategy. So I will talk about a few things that have changed and my experience here. So one was when I first joined, and whether you join as a consultant or an associate when you come in, I think what you will find here very quickly is you're given a lot of responsibilities. And that was something that surprised me. So I always thought that you know maybe as an associate, they'll give me some like Excel to play around with, like I'll do some fancy slides, and like that's my kind of roles and responsibilities. My first project was working with a Southeast Asian government and shaping the investment strategy. I was out there talking to companies about like, you know, what kind of incentives will you guys be looking for from governments? I was interviewing with, you know, the ministers in the government on like, you know, what kind of incentives would work and not work. And I was put right in front of that module. And obviously my project leader would come along with me, but a lot of like the interview guide, the interviews itself that was happening was all done by myself. He was there supporting me, but I was just a little, I guess, overwhelmed, but at the same time, just fascinated by how much responsibility they would give to a person who's coming in fresh. And I found that really exciting because it didn't feel like I was just a person behind an Excel spreadsheet or a person just sitting behind a computer. I was out there talking to clients. And I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that's something that BCG pushes you to do. And it puts you out there in the real world talking to people so that just the stuff that you put on slide and the stuff that you recommend to clients are not just stuff on the paper and stuff that you thought about. It's stuff that you thought about, you've tested it in the real world, and these are solutions that actually really work. So I thought that was very cool. 
and it opened me to kind of a lot of opportunities and I guess experiences that I wouldn't thought wouldn't have thought I guess a 24 year old who's coming fresh out of school would know or would basically get in touch with. So I think that was you know me as an associate and obviously my experiences then was I just kind of wanted to travel really. One thing that excited me about consulting was like cool I get to travel like they'll pay for my flight. I get to you know visit different countries in Southeast Asia because I was started in the Singapore office. So my staffing kind of took that direction as well. I just told staff my staffing like just put me anywhere as long as it's on a flight somewhere else outside of my country. And obviously as you fast forward your career now I'm a project leader and at the same time I'm married and I have a family. So I found that BCG has been a place where you can really shape your experiences. So as a project leader for one is you're learning different things. So instead of just you know having a module, I now actually coach people that come into the company who are brand new, kind of what I was fast forward a few years back. And at the same time, like you're in front of a client, you're much more shaping the project, you know, you're talking to much more senior leaders. The last client that I was at, my main client was the CEO of a media company. And she was she's been in, in that position in the industry for 20 years and I would sit beside her and be sparring ideas about like how could you do things differently in the, in the industry that she knew much better than I did. And to me, again, I always felt like BCG is always pushing me to do more. I never felt like I was in a position where I was comfortable. I knew what I, you know, I was doing. I kind of felt like I was always on this edge of being comfortable and being uncomfortable at the same time, which is kind of exciting because you're always learning and always developing. And from a personal perspective, Obviously, the getting on a flight every Monday and then coming back on a Friday did not work very well with my husband, as we found out. He was like, I don't think you should be getting on a flight. So um, consult, again, I think that's the flexibility and the beauty of BCG is that you get to shape a lot of your experiences. I started becoming more of a local focus, locally focused kind of, I did more locally focused projects. So in my past two years, I haven't actually traveled out of Toronto except for one project where I was in Montreal, but really, Montreal is kind of like there's a flight every hour. I could go there for a day trip and come back. So I just wanted to share the perspective of how a trajectory across BCG could look like from a professional standpoint, but also from the standpoint of how it's an experience that is very customizable for like what your kind of personal experiences need to be as well. So that's a little bit about like my kind of experience. The other dimension of how I think BCG has allowed me to grow was I started in the Singapore office, so a lot of projects I did there was from the developing economy. So we did a lot of projects around, you know, in, even in the TMT industry, it's about like the prepaid market because that's like 90% of what Indonesia's mobile economy is about. It's about how do you price to the minute because people were switching mobile plans all like just based on which was cheaper that month. People had like three different SIM cards from three different like operators, and obviously that's a very different world here. So. And then I had the experience to go on a, like an exchange program to Toronto, the Toronto office for a year. So I spent time in Toronto and then after that I left and joined Starwood Hotels and then I came back to BCG. So again, I felt like BCG was always supportive of you know, what I wanted to do, the experiences I wanted to get, as well as like even when the experience was not within BCG, but it was something that was helpful to my growth, I felt that people were very open to conversations and, and supported me that way. Oops, I think you missed a slide. I feel like I deleted a slide. Anyway, there's a slide missing in there. I should probably have deleted it. So the other thing I wanted to touch on and see if I can bring it back. I feel like it was here before. Oh, there we go. So the question that I get a lot of time when I told people I've left BCG and came back is, why did you decide to come back? And I think a lot of it came down to the people. Um, and a lot of you might, see, might not see BCG as a place that you belong to, but to be honest, a lot of times I felt like I didn't belong in the BCG world either. There's really no typical BCG person. Even if you take like, you know, for example, in the Singapore office, you would think that me as a Singaporean would be a majority. No, I think there was maybe about five Singaporeans in the entire BCG Singapore office. It's a hugely diverse crowd. And from a profession or from a background standpoint, like these are some of my colleagues in the Toronto office today. 
one of my colleagues used to be a TV producer. He was a news producer for one of the Toronto companies. Um, obviously, we have a lot of fresh graduates from different, you know, academic background. One of my one of the BCG partners that I work with very closely, he used to be a, a computer engineer, and he has five patents to his name. Pretty awesome. I feel like I maybe don't belong up there in the ranks. We have a person who now runs a taco restaurant on the side as well. If you guys check it out, her restaurant's called Campuchano. It's on, I think, Richmond Street West. So she took time off and she opened up that restaurant. Her tacos are pretty good. They make their taco shells from scratch, so I'll definitely highly recommend that. But that's another one of our colleagues. We had a professional poker player as well. <laughs> So he was a poker player, went to the U of T MBA program and joined BCG. So I guess you could really take many different paths. And there's a lot of people who come from PhD background as well. Like one of my colleagues that I was having lunch with yesterday, he has a PhD in um, material engineering. And then the, another one of my colleagues that I, you know, I'm pretty close to, he has a PhD in genetics. So all this to say, I feel like, you know, why I chose to come back from BCG is one, I always feel like I'm always learning from the people that I work with. The people that I work with always make me feel like I come to work and there's always interesting perspectives that I can learn from. And most of all, I find them very humble and very willing to share because it always makes me feel so humble just working with people like this who are every day challenging your thinking, pushing you to learn more stuff. Like even having dinners with these people, I learned so much about like, how do you make a taco? Like what goes into, what goes into a great taco? Or like, how do you like play poker? Like, What's, that, what's a big, good strategy for it? Like, it's just interesting, like, being around people like that. And I think that was just a lot of, like, what drove me back. I missed kind of the dynamism of the work. But a lot of it was I missed the people that I worked with. So that's a little bit about, like, my own experiences and why I feel like this is such a special place for me. This was a quote that, you know, they asked me why they wanted to create, a, like, a website profile for BCG and they asked me for a quote and I kind of feel like this kind of summarizes my experience. I don't really put, I can't really put my hand onto like what's so special about this place, but there's something magical about putting like wonderful people together who are so diverse with so like so much perspective of, on the world to share with clients with interesting problems and who all want to make an impact in this world. And when you put all of that together, it just creates a magical solution where not only you help your clients and you know help them create strategies that work, but at the same time you yourself find that you develop in ways that you never imagined. And so that's kind of like a little bit of my story. And so maybe I thought we can pause here and see if there are questions about, you know, BCG, how do you think you might fit in here before we launch into like what BCG work is really like. Anyone? Maybe the guy at the back there. As you mentioned, there's a lot of people from different backgrounds. So how do you, is there a very extensive training program that you guys put everybody through so that everybody's kind of on the same page? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are definitely programs that are put in place when you first join BCG. There's a standard like ELST, which is elementary skills learning. I can't, we have so many acronyms, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a week long program where you get trained. And if you're not from a business background as well, there's a specific program that you go through to get you trained up on all the business terminologies that you use. So that's kind of like a crash course, if you will, at the start. But to be honest, a lot of the training that I, there's that formal training, and then obviously at different junctures in your career, like six months in, you get an advanced like consultant training. You know, once you become a PL, you get PL training. But those are kind of like, I would call the formal training. I would say a lot of it happens informally as well. So whether it's me, like, I've never worked with big data before two years ago. I had to learn a big data tool. had no idea how to build it, but I sat down with an associate who was like a whiz at it, and it would just spend an hour and teach you. And I feel like a lot of that organic learning that happens within BCG is probably the majority of how learning takes place. And obviously, there's last of all kind of like the more on-demand training, where if you're looking for a topic, there's kind of you know, on-demand training that you can just go on to, and it's pretty extensive as well. I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like there, obviously there's a lot of commonalities. I think one is everyone's really, I guess, curious about the world in general. Because, and the reason why I say that is because, like, I don't work with all these people all the time. But sometimes I'm like in the office at 8 o'clock and I'm stuck on a problem. I don't need to go to someone who is like on my case. I can just go to someone else and I'm like, I have a difficult problem. Like, do you mind sitting with me for like 15 minutes? I just need to talk this through with somebody. And people are actually very willing. And you'll find that they're very interested in what you're doing and they get like really excited about it. It's one of those, I guess, I don't know, geeky adrenaline rushes that you guys get. I don't know if you guys get that. But we do and then like we'll start like drawing stuff and I think that's part of, you know, what the BCG culture is like. People are generally very curious and very willing to help. I think the other thing that really shapes BCG and what's common about these people is I find that people are very passionate about what they do. They usually kind of like, the moment they decide they need to do something, there's an energy and like an inertia, like a whole like momentum behind getting stuff done, which I think also helps with kind of, you know, who these people are. A lot of people call us like type A people. I don't really feel like type A is the right word. I just feel like people just have a lot of energy and a lot of passion, and it doesn't just stem towards the work we do. It can just be like someone decides that our pantry food is like horrible. We should change it up, and someone would be like, "I'm going to launch a survey, put it out there, and then like go to like the office head and think about what we should change in the pantry." And that kind of passion just, I guess, just lights up the entire workplace because it's about just people thinking about how we can make life in general better. So I don't know if that answers your, qu your question, but it's a little more of the softer side of things, I know, than kind of like a hard, tangible thing that connects everybody. But I feel like that entire problem-solving curiosity and passion that people bring to the job is something that's pretty common. Right, so BCG is growing in like many different ways. So I would probably say like three different things. So one is definitely the growth geographically. We're definitely, we're opening more offices than, we're opening a lot more offices than we used to. So when I first joined BCG, we didn't have a Vietnam office. We didn't have a Casablanca office. We didn't, Canada for example, when I first came in 2010, we only had the Toronto office. So now we have three Canada offices. We have an office in Calgary as well as in Montreal. We have Casablanca. We have lots of offices that opened in Africa as well. So geographically, there's a lot of areas that BCG has not covered, and we're starting to expand and grow our footprints that way. The second thing in terms of how we're growing is in terms of capabilities. So whether it's through organic you know, kind of growth or whether it's through acquisitions, we've been growing in developing many different capabilities. So like big data is one area that we're trying to develop organically. So we now have a big data team that's based out in Boston with data scientists that we can work with if we're working with you know, a huge amount of data that we need to mine. We have a geoanalytics, geoanalytics team that's part of it as well. Um, other capabilities, for example, we, have, we bought digital ventures. So that's something that a lot of our clients are interested in because they're going to the mobile world, they're developing apps. So we want to be able to support them in those areas as well. So new capabilities, definitely like one that we're developing a lot. And I would say the last one is just in terms of like the clients as well as the work that we do, there's a lot of innovation that's going on in terms of like the clients that we serve. We definitely don't serve a lot of clients today that there's still a lot of white space out there. So in terms of you know just building whether it's the clients that we already have and building them into bigger clients or is it going out there and basically getting more clients that we haven't served before and new industries for example and developing our capabilities in those i would say those are kind of the three areas and underpinning all of them it's really developing our people because if you don't grow the number of partners and the project leaders and the principles that you have to support all these growth that's happening across bcg that's probably difficult to sustain as well no, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you can you walk us through sort of your first couple of days before you are doing in order to select the sort of base you get your first very first project? Like, is it you select you tell the case selection person you want to travel and you want to work in healthcare, and then right? It, and then they kind of just walk you through case. So I would say staffing. It's so a lot of people like to think about staffing as a black box, but it's kind of like it's it it kind of. 
balances different needs, of course, right? There's your own like personal interests. There's your development needs. There's obviously what's available as a project at that point in time. So I would say these three together come to kind of inform what your, your staffing outcome would look like. So first of all would be your interest. So for me, when I was an associate, I basically went like, I just want to get on a flight. Like, it doesn't matter where. I don't care the industry. I don't care about like whether it's a big team or a small team. It doesn't matter. And then as you get more, I guess some people come in and say like, I really want to do healthcare. I just want to you know, be in this industry. Obviously, there are different you know, dimensions that you can kind of emphasize on. It's going to be really hard to staff you if you go like, I want to work in a team of three. I want it to be in Hawaii. And I want it to have, I don't know, it has to be in like the travel industry. And I want to have a module that does X, Y, and Z. That's going to be difficult, I would say. I won't say it's impossible. But the chances of that is probably like you hitting the jackpot because like there's so many other factors that come out. Like, first of all, there needs to be a project like that that exists. But I think if you're reasonable around like what your priorities are, if you give kind of two, three dimensions that you're trying to optimize around, like staffing usually comes around pretty well. Then the next input is just in terms of like what do you need to develop? So some people need, you may hit quant, but unfortunately that's a skill that you need to develop. And we will have to put you on a quant kind of case if that comes up. So there's that staffing input that comes from your career council. And then last of all is kind of what's available in the pipeline. Like even if you love to do healthcare, and at the time that you come up for staffing, there isn't a healthcare case, likely you need to be flexible. And I think about staffing more as a long-term vision, right? It's not like you come in and you get what you want day one. But if you tell staffing this is kind of your career trajectory and what you want out of it, I would say like give it you know six months a year, you'll definitely find yourself getting into what you're going into. So I'll keep moving on just because I want to get into casework as well. And then we can take more questions as we go from there. Cool? So, oh, actually, no. Before I get there, so I obviously wasn't familiar with the TMT industry. So all this talks about like gigabytes and like how much, you know, megabytes of like um, data do you need to buy, how fast the speed do you need to buy to basically like, you know, be able to watch Netflix. So any guess if you have an HD TV? How many gigabytes, how many, like, what's the speed that you need to, like, stream a HD Netflix stream? Or how much, how many, like, what speed of internet package would you buy to do that? One Sorry? One megabytes. Four megabytes? One. Anyone else? One? Ten? Ten, Ten megabits? Anyone else? Yeah, but assume for now, like if you're the only person, like how many megabits would you want to buy? Five? Pretty good. I feel like I was not in that realm. I was like, I'm going to get the best internet in, that I can find. I don't know how many of you guys are in the camp. You guys don't have to raise your hands if you guys are. But I was kind of like, I think I need 50. So anyway. So this is just an, I thought I'd give you an example of an industry that I worked in where I had no idea what it was about. And maybe that's a parallel for how the business world might be like to you. So this was a case where we did where our client wanted to launch, basically roll out fiber across their network. And they were basically saying, we need to target two gig of speed. And I thought this was a good example to share one because this was an example where, you know, obviously I think it's a parallel to how you guys will feel going into a different industry and working there. But also, too, I think this is a great example of how a lot of times you hear people saying consulting is what, you know, you, give, you take people's watch and you tell them the time. I think this is one where we went in and the client had a very clear perspective about what they wanted to do. And we told them you shouldn't be doing that. And to me, that was really nice because to be able to stand up and prove somebody and actually persuade them is a lot of it's a, it's, a, it's a win, I think, from outside. So if you look at it, like even if you had a 4K TV, or you basically could stream 12 Netflix concurrently on your, on your TV if you had a 2 gig internet. And even if you did that, and even if you had that 2 gig speed, the truth is, how many of you guys plug your, your, your like, TV directly into your, into your like, internet cable? 
I definitely serve via Wi-Fi. So first of all, great. Like if you want to, if you have that many TV that you're going to stream at one time and you're watching all of them concurrently, fantastic. Good reason to get one gig internet. But the other thing is, you kind of need to plug that in to be able to get that to work. The Wi-Fi, once it's beyond a certain distance, the speed that you're going to get, it's going to be very low. So from a consumer perspective, we kind of prove to them that there's, you know, first of all, not a huge case for why an educated person will actually need such an internet, uh, need such a high speed, you know, internet um, for you to roll out fiber throughout your entire network. But obviously from a business case perspective, and that's where I think that was fun because I had to go talk to the network architecture person and he was throwing me all these like, oh, the Doxis technology is like moving from 3.0 to like 3.1. Now we're going to have like OFDM. I was like, great, awesome. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what OFDM was. I had to like Google it. I, had, I was like, I remember in my first meeting writing down all these acronyms that I Googled later on, and I was like, I can't find it because like I didn't even know what I was writing. <laughs> so I had to like go ask somebody, and I remember reading like a huge textbook on the how the communications work. And obviously, you know, as the pro project went on, I was able to kind of draw what a network is, and we eventually even built a network. A network model for them on how would you upgrade a network because we convinced them to stay on a hybrid fiber coax kind of architecture versus going to a pure fiber end-to-end -end, um, cable architecture and we said you know you need to kind of think about when you want to upgrade every single node across your network at which point in time and which is the, the technology path that you want to take so I think this is a good parallel for you know if you came from an a background that was completely different from your project that you were doing, that one, obviously, there's the hope idea of I'm drowning in the first week or so. But then again, you will find that in BCG, one is you learn things really quickly. Two is there's a lot of resources around you. During this period of time, like I talked to people who were in, based in Dubai, in BCG, that, was based, that had huge telco experience. I was talking to someone in Australia. I talked to a partner in London as well that was helping me get up to speed on all these things. I had a team member, and it was funny because I was the project leader, and I had a team member who, was, who used to work at BlackBerry. And he was teaching me what OFDM stands for. He was like, it's oct octagonal frequency multiplexing something. <laughs> now I forget. So he was going to be upset with me. But anyway, so like, there's so much resources just around like teaching you like how to get up to speed on things. And eventually, at the end of it, like I was sitting down with the network team and teaching them how to use the model that I created for them. And so I think this is a good example just to show you how, like, in BCG, you don't have to be an expert in everything, and we don't expect you to be when you join. And it's fine if you came from a background that, you know, obviously is different from business, but there's so many resources out there to just help you get up to speed on something that you can be credible in front of the client very quickly and will help you get up to speed to a depth where you can actually contribute to a client as well. So I thought that was one example I'll share. And the other one that I do a lot of work in is in media. So I thought I would share that because that's an, ex that's an area that I find it's hard to find an answer for. And it's one that the media industry is constantly changing, right? Like if you think about what, how you consume media 10 years ago versus how you consume media today, or even like the, the, the new technology that's coming up, like Crave TV. Like, show me was existed a year ago. It didn't exist anymore. Like, it's an industry that's changing so fast and so fascinating. And that's one where I find case work at, at BCG puts you at the forefront of how these industries came in so quickly. So the next few slides are not really to share with you, like, you know, the wonderful work that we're doing, but like, just to give you a sense of like the questions that we grapple with as we work with our clients. So just to introduce a, a little bit to how the media industry work. A lot of media industry, you know, the way the industry is funded can be by advertising, which is kind of, you know, if you think about your TV, your major broadcasters, like you don't pay to watch CTV, like it's funded by ads. There is the other way, which is subscription funded. And then obviously some of it can be crowdsourced as well. So the interesting thing about like the ad industry, which a lot of TV companies today are struggling with, is if you look at how the ad dollars have been shifting, Essentially, you're basically moving to almost like a duopoly. Google and Facebook now owns about 80% of the entire ad industry market. And Google and Facebook are global. 
if you compare that to like Bell Media, if you compare that to Chorus, and if you compare that to Rogers Media, like how would these Canadian companies compete going forward? Like those are the questions that our clients are asking us. Like, what about this whole idea of like made in Canada? Like a production that's made from in Canada? Like, is there how would Canadian advertisers still be able to target very Canadian audiences? So, and how would the CRTC, which is kind of like the Canadian regulations of you know this entire industry, work? Would it still be relevant in, in this new era? I think those are all like questions that we we have. And to me, I find that fascinating because our clients are asking that question every day, and we're trying to help them grapple with an industry that's completely changing. Um, the other one that I thought I'd share, and. Then, and this is interesting as well, is if you think about the media that you've been consuming in the last few years, nowadays it's either everyone's watching the big blockbusters, you know, like you're watching Blacklist, you're watching all the big shows that are coming up, and then there's this long tail of consumers which are watching, I guess, you know, your PewDiePie's on like YouTube, and I don't know what you guys watch, but I was quite surprised when I found out about PewDiePie. I was watching it, and I was like, do you guys know PewDiePie? Yeah, I, when I watched it, I was like, why would I watch it? Anyway, if you guys watch it, I won't. You can tell, you can explain that to me. But in the past, like, if you think about TV, even five years back, a lot of the middle tier television shows, they're all struggling today, right? And if you think about that from a Canadian company, media company perspective, to do one of the blockbusters is going to cost you like millions, if not billions of dollars. And yet, the long tail of content is not something that they play very well in because that's something that's a lot, a lot of times user generated. So with the budget they have, how would this Canadian media company continue to like attract audiences and create their own content? And the other question is, great, maybe they can go acquire this content from you know CBS or from Fox TV or from HBO down south. But the truth is, even the people who are buying up these content. You have Netflix who's going to go out and buy, and they're going to buy against your Canadian media companies because they want to have it on Netflix Canada. So once you have it on Netflix Canada, and if they have the same showing window rights as as your you know CTV or whatever public TV, CTV is not going to want to pay that amount because like you're going to split the audiences, right? So this whole idea of how like the media landscape's changing and how would Canadian TV still be relevant? And will we have the scale to compete once this gets more and more global? Because Netflix and Amazon are buying with a global budget, whereas we're buying, or like the Canadian media companies that we work with, they're buying with a much smaller budget. So a lot of it right now is about like how do you make the media companies more efficient so that they can deal with an environment that's not as feasible. But at this point in time, you know, this is something that a lot of our media companies in Canada grapple with, and that's a lot of the conversations that we're having with our clients. I can't say I have the answers to all of them at this point in time, but there's definitely things that they're doing to kind of see, if, one, how can they survive in an environment like this, but two, at the same time, how can they start dabbling with new media that may not be what their core is. So I'll pause here, because I feel like I gave you two examples. One is kind of you know how your experiences, which may not be entirely business, but how would that relate to FBC, relate to your BCG? And I think I gave you a second example, which is kind of like, you know, how you can be at the forefront of very interesting topics that are currently changing in the industry. And just wanted to see here if we have questions about like the work at BCG, what kind of work we do. I'm happy to talk about other industries as well, but this is just something that I work in pretty closely with. Yeah. So for sure. So in Canada, a lot of our it will basically revolve very similarly to what the Canadian economy is. So we do quite a bit of like oil and gas. Um, we do like natural resources as well. We have a big financial industry. We do retail, consumer, uh, telecommunications as well. So those would be the four major ones. And then obviously, if you're interested in something that our Canadian offices don't do. There are people out there who do you know, totally different stuff outside of our office. You can be staffed into our Boston office. The guy that I talked to you about who, does, uh, who has a PhD in genetics, he's now staffed in our Boston office. So he's working on 
you know, pharmaceutical and life sciences stuff as well. So BCG in, in general has many different protocols. I would say the Canadian office is the four major ones that I talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how difficult is it for like transfer between offices? I would say it's very difficult to transfer between offices. So there are a few, there's different levels of transfer, if you would call it. So there's, first of all, across office staffing, which means that you know, we have colleagues that will go and work in Australia for like a four month case. We have um, associates going to Dubai and working for cases out there. There are people that go and work with, you know, not within BCG, but they go transfer to a DV office and they work with a DV project for a little bit. So you can definitely do project based kind of transfers. Then there is kind of more of an exchange based transfer, if you will, which is kind of like the associate abroad program. Or you could go on um, the consultant one, which is the ambassador program. So that's kind of more a medium term transfer. And then there's the permanent transfer as well. If you are kind of moving yourself and relocating your family, then there's the, trans the option of being able to transfer, which is what I did as well when I moved from Singapore back to Toronto permanently. And it, at the end of the day, I think for BCG, it's a matter of like, we want to keep people and we want to make sure that we're supportive, right? So I don't think transfer is a really difficult thing if your family has decided to move and we have an office there it makes more sense to transfer you than to lose you as a talent. Well, sometimes what we do is we do scenarios. So like versus like saying, you know, there's a huge range between what this and that could be. Because so, just from a, there's usually ranges as well when, when we're doing our estimates, but it's hard for someone to grapple with like, well, you, you could go, your stock price could be this or that. It's easier to say like, well, your stock price in the best case scenario is this. We think the optimist, the expect, expected case would be that. And then the worst case would be. X, Y, Z, which is essentially the same thing. You're just giving them three ranges, but framing it slightly differently. Or the other way we do it is through sensitivity. So we will present one case, and then we say, like, well, if it's if you do a sensitivity on this particular variable, like that will be how it will look like. So that's usually how we present it. Yeah. So it's, I think it's quite similar to how you guys would do it as well. There's usually a range, and you guys do sensitivities on like different variables. Yeah, I think your hand was up for a while. So we'll take the question here and we'll come back to you. Thanks. So I heard that first the new hires in BCG are trained are mostly trained as generalists. Yeah. So how general can a trade be then? For example, can someone work in investments of stocks as at the same time pharmaceutical and like the two companies? Yeah, for sure. So I can tell you about what I did because Remember I told you my like only constraint to my staffer was just like, just put me on the fly. So on my, in my first two years at BCG, I worked on, my first case was a government in Southeast Asia on investment strategy. My second case was, you know, pricing in a telecommunications company in another Southeast Asian country. And then I did branding for another te telecommunications company. And then I also did a financial services case where we were redesigning branch processes. Then I moved to Canada, and I did a project on retail where we're de redesigning uh, the retail, de the department stores. Uh, and that was like a consumer study where we did focus groups and all of those fun stuff. Then I did a due diligence for a company who was looking to buy a Target in, that was based in North America. No, that was based in Europe, but they had operations in North America. So we were part of the North American team looking at the North American operations for it. Then I did a project in North in in the US, there was on a home renovations company and how their store network expansion strategy should look like. And then what else have I done since? I've done network strategy in telco. I've done media companies in terms of uh, post-merger acquisitions. I've done a redesign for a telecommunications company as well. So I think the amount, like the transferability of the skill set definitely is huge, especially when you first come into the firm. But typically what people find is that as you get more senior, it's easier to specialize in at least a certain like geographical, not geographical, but like certain industry or functional area. Just because when you're getting more senior, 
you're starting to deal with you know people who are a little more senior than you. You need to go in knowing a little bit about the company, or at least the industry. So just having experience in a function or a geographic area or an industry helps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were. And you know, obviously when you are going in with a different answer from what the client expects, you kind of want to be prepared with your arsenal of like, here's the reason why. So obviously not that one slide that I showed you. That one slide was like part of a big pack of reasons why. So we first showed them like, why is there not a reason for a consumer needing it? The second reason why we showed them, we did a, a huge consumer study on like how many people think they have fiber? How many of people they know how many, what speed they're actually getting. And it was very interesting because that survey actually showed that a lot of people think that they have fiber internet in their house because, you know, like Bell kind of markets themselves as having Bell Fibe. Bell Fibe's not fiber, by the way. <laughs> Just telling you. So if you think you're getting fiber, you're not. So like, it was really interesting because you can actually map out like how many people have fiber because you know all where all the networks are. And the, the number of people that told us they had fiber and lived in places that had no fiber was really interesting, which again, proved to them that like fiber can be a lot more of a marketing thing than it is a real consumer tangible thing that people actually go out and buy. So that was like one whole, like there was the whole consumer argument. Then there was the whole argument around the technology. So the Doxis 3.1 technology is actually, um, actually increases the, up, the uplink or the upstream kind of capacity of um, the, the fiber, the non-fiber technology. And as it goes along, it's actually projected to kind of hit pretty close to where fiber would, would be able to deliver. So unless you're looking at like trying to kind of supply internet to businesses, which a lot of throughput at the same time and a lot of uplink or upstream kind of um, customers, you don't actually need a, a fiber network. So that was the technology bit. And then the last of it was kind of like down to how would you manage your network if you had a HFC? So first of all, teaching them on how, how would you manage it such that your capacity, because their in-going assumption was like, well, if I need to keep investing in this network, well, it might make sense to just like pull it out and like we need lay new cable, right? It's kind of like you thinking about, I have to renovate the house, the plumbing is broken all the time, must also well just tear it all up and like rebuild it. And then we had to prove to them the business case that like, well, actually investing in your own network will prove to be still a lot cheaper in the long run, which is why that network model came about. And then the second thing was, they weren't actually managing their customers really well. So you can actually manage your customer because you know how much of your customers are actually the ones that are hogging your network versus the ones that are not. And so that led to another strategy that we helped them with, which is kind of how do you manage your customer churn? And how do you actively like, cut, not cut off your customer, but basically throttle people who are actually abusing a network versus the people who are actually using it in a fair manner. So with like a whole comprehensive piece of analysis, you kind of have to you know, bring them around to your point of view. But definitely it's not an easy conversation going in and disagreeing with like the head of technology who's sitting across the table from you and has been in his role for like many years. But it was an interesting experience. I think that for me, that stood to a lot of like what BCG stands for, which is kind of we bring the right answers and the right answers might not be what the client wants all the time. Any other questions about casework? Um, with respect to like, uh, in, like incoming consultants, what degree of like business acumen is essential for like so Well, to be honest, I would say that like there have been people there are people who came from business non business background that have like no idea how to read like a, a profit loss statement at all. And that's not something that we expect you to come in knowing because that's not your background, but that's what the training that BCG provides is. So it's almost like a one week MBA program that they put you through so that at least coming out of it, you will be able to kind of read what a financial statement looks like and you know have the basics of what an EBITDA is versus sales versus gross margin. I think that level of understanding is probably required as part of the job just because those are like key business metrics. But I would say like if you're going through the process just knowing what the basics of what's the difference between sales, gross margins, and a couple of like key business terms will be what I would want to know. But if you need, to, you don't have to learn how to build like a discounted cash flow model or like you know learn what four P's of marketing. Like I think those are helpful. 
But I think just having, you know, just being a consumer and being curious about like, how would you think about the profit margin of a company? And I think those kind of more intuitive business sense are more helpful than actually like going to read a whole like MBA book. Yeah. In terms of? Yeah. Yeah. Very common they have one here at Rock Right. At Shula. I well, I guess if you don't know really what it is. Yeah. It's essentially you're kind of compressing an MBA the basic kind of right. things of business um, into like a couple of weeks. Right. I think if you're interested in pursuing a career that is in business, I would say that that's probably a good idea. And the reason why I say that is also because a lot of consulting, so you can kind of come from two angles, right? Like I came from a business background, and obviously you have to learn everything else outside of business that I have to deal with. But at the same time, if you're, I find that a lot of work that we do right now is at the intersection of like a knowledge base that's outside of business and business as well. And I, I think the word is converging such that, you know, the business knowledge, comp when you combine it with something else, is such so much more powerful that even if it's not consulting that you're thinking of, I think that it might be a good idea. But I think that might be more kind of where you're heading from a career standpoint and what you might be considering. Yeah. And is that more like when you talk about specialized, is it when you joined BCG or before? Uh, when you like when you apply for it. As in when you have already got the job at BCG and then when? No, 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 no. Like, so like how would you get, like, so for, for BCG? Yeah. Um, it's the case more of the general or like more of the specialized? I don't think we differentiate between like the generalist and the, and the specialist. For, to be honest, because we have so many people that come from so many different backgrounds. Like one of our partners has a master in sculpture. <laughs> Very specialized, right? So like, I think it's really more about like, once you kind of make it through, I think what they try to look for in your resume is really, you know, whether there is the spirit of excellence, obviously, and excellence can be in any field that you're specialized in, but also kind of like what extracurricular activities you're doing. And I think once you are through the interview process, when I'm when I'm doing interviews, it's not really about like your background and your experience anymore. It's like how do you actually approach a case? How do you actually solve a problem? And that to me is pretty transferable across like what you're specialized in. Yeah. 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 So for me, it was more. I would say it's more like by chance than it was by like design. I, th I really liked working, so I told you I like kind of worked all over the place. I had no idea what I wanted to specialize in, and to be honest, I never thought I would specialize in TMT because I've never an engineer. I thought I would go like do retail and travel because also like fun and sexy and like interesting. And to me, the reason why I chose to do TMT was one because it allowed me to be local, right? And then the second reason why was because I just enjoyed working with the partners that worked in this space. So. A lot of people specialize for different reasons. Some people might have a strong interest in like healthcare, and that's really what they want to do. For me, it was, I really just enjoy working with BCG, I enjoy solving problems. And then what I wanted to optimize around was my life, and a lot of it was what will allow me to stay local. So outside of TMT, when there isn't a TMT project that's local, the other thing I do is consumer and retail, because that's something that's local as well, that we do quite a bit in Toronto. And you don't really feel like you have to specialize as well. Like, I kind of have done media, telecommunications, and consumer. Those are kind of like my three areas of specialty, if you will. But like, then again, these are like three big areas of industries that I can still go into. And a lot of project leaders don't specialize till much later, too. There are partners that do like two industries. There are partners that don't actually specialize in any of them. And that's totally fine. I think we have the questions right at the back.
Right. Well, I would say there are different sources. So obviously there's like, you know, looking, there's the research databases that we have access to, kind of like what you, you guys might have access to. So like whether it's financial information on Thompson database, or it's, you know, the economist, or like specialized like industry databases that we actually subscribe to at BCG. And sometimes not through us, like sometimes our, we have a knowledge team that has access to these kind of um, databases. So that's one. There is also like, you know, BCG proprietary information that we have access to just because we have worked with, for example, in retail, we've worked with so many retail companies across that we can say the average percent, like, like a percentage of store labor to like percentage of sales would be X in like a big grocery retailer, for example. So like BCG has proprietary databases just based on all the information we've worked, we have collected. Then there's the expert database that we leverage on. So like we can call on like experts um, from maybe we can talk to say like five different people who have worked in the HR in in big media companies because we wanted to find out you know what's the best way to structure kind of a media company in in a certain situation. So those are like I guess you know three data sources that we have, and then obviously you can lay on your BCG in like analysis on top of it and come up with like your own uh, numbers as well. But I don't know if that answers kind of your question about how we get our sources. Cool. I think we had a hand. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. So to me, the reason why I left BCG was because I always felt like, you know, if I was only doing consulting, I only knew how to be a consultant. I never really understood like how it was like to be on the client side of things. And the other reason why I left and, you know, obviously I was able to go pursue an MBA. I could go like, you know, join a startup or like some fun stuff. But I just wanted to, I just thought like, one, I already have the BCG resume, like to, for me to kind of try something different. I felt like I was always kind of like the risk adverse student in school. It's like, you know, you go from, you know, doing this to doing that to doing this and then you would land a great job, like awesome, like perfect formula, right? And I kind of felt like it was at that time in my life where I was like, I'm, I want to try something different. I want to try something that I'm really passionate about. And I always loved travel. I loved hotels. I don't know if you guys are familiar with travel hotels, but they're basically the number one luxury hotel owners in the world. They own like the West End, the Sheraton, the St. Regis, the luxury collection, and so on and so forth, until they were recently bought by Merit. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so I wanted to do that. So I went back to Southeast Asia and helped manage three of their brands that they were developing. So they were developing their mid-tier brands. So I was the brand manager for it. And I also wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to do something completely like right brain as well. So I did like marketing and branding, which to me was really fascinating. And to your question around what, why, like how has that helped me in, in come at, coming back to BCG? One is I think I have a better appreciation of like how it feels like to be on the client side when you have a consultant coming to you on top of your day job that you're doing and giving you all these things that you have to do. And even like stuff like, you know, if I'm developing a plan for them, like I'm a little bit more realistic about what can happen and how things actually work in a big organization and understanding the dynamics of how that kind of works. So it made me one, I think more empathetic to my clients, but two also I have a deeper appreciation for how things work in a corporate world that allows me to navigate the clients a lot better. And I think last of all is the clients actually feel more appreciated versus like, you know, I've been at BCG forever and I'm just a consultant versus, you know, I can actually go talk to the head of marketing at the media company and said like, I used to run marketing for like Southeast Asia, for the whole of Asia Pacific for Star Wars hotels. Like it actually makes you more credible because you're no longer just like, an external consultant to them. You're someone who actually has been in an industry before. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's a definitely a good question. Like, you know, when I was talking to the network person, 
the first client meeting that I went to, I wasn't the one going by myself and like not knowing every single thing. Like I brought, we had someone on the call that was from BCG who had experience in network. So like definitely leveraging the BCG network so that like you're not the most, like it doesn't appear that BCG is completely inexperienced. Like you can kind of fall back on somebody who knows what they're talking about. So I think that's one. I think the second thing is, I find that when you're actually honest with your clients, they're actually really willing to teach you. The head of network actually brought me over to like one of the network centers. He like showed me what a fiber cable was. Like, have you ever touched a fiber cable? He was like, let me show you. And then he's like, here, this is what a fiber looks like. I'm like, oh, great. And then so, first of all, I think clients are actually really, really nice people. And they, they, are, they know that when they hire a consultant, they're not hiring someone who's like been in the industry for 20 years. They're hiring someone who is able to help, you know, one, drive change to their organization and bring a different perspective. So, you know, not knowing too much about that, it's fine. But I think what you want to show is that you can learn really fast and then you can actually contribute and ask them the right questions. So towards the end, like this network person and I actually like worked really closely together. Like he was kind of the thought partner. I will ask him very open questions about like, you know, I have no idea what this technology is. And then at the same time, I'll be challenging him to think about why would you do it this way? Because I would think that there's a, another way to do it. So I think that interesting client dynamics between not knowing something, but at the same time willing to question and challenge is a dynamic that you can build with your client that actually helps build your credibility. And at the end of the day, what you want to do within a very short period of time is to be able to deliver value, right? It's fine if the first week you're kind of asking like all these questions, but in the fourth week, if you're still asking all these questions, then that's probably not something that will be really helpful. So I think that's kind of maybe the answer to your question is, I think it's challenging up front, but you also realize that the, the curve at which you learn at BCG is so fast that it's really funny, but people call me now at BCG and like, hey, I heard you're the expert in the network. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, can you repeat that again? Ah, uh, that our Canada office is facing. I think that's a good question. I think one is definitely that, you know, the growth in our smaller offices is something that we're trying to do. Like, it's something that we're trying to kind of build up very quickly because one, you know, it's hard to, to kind of, we have two pretty small offices, Montreal and Calgary. I think we're trying to grow those offices pretty quickly, but at the same time, it's also a matter of like, can we, are we able to find the talent that we're, we're able to. I think the other one that I might think about is kind of like the business, the Canadian business is actually growing really fast. We've been growing at double digits for the last three years, which if you compare it to the Canadian economy or if you compare it to the consulting economy in general, I think that's some, that's a growth that probably it is great for the company, but at the same time, what's, what you see kind of is like we're importing a lot of stuff from the US. Or some of our projects may not be, you know, we, we're basically kind of loading a lot more on our teams than we actually need to. So that's something that we're trying to solve right now. So, you know, for example, we're now, we just sold a huge case and we need to staff 40 people on it. We don't have 40 people in Canada that are available, not working on anything that we can just put on it. So we're basically calling every office in North America and saying, how many people do you have? We need to staff these people. We need to find project leaders. We need to find principals. We need to find like partners to kind of come to Canada and then we need to get them all visas and like all fun stuff that they need to get to. But it's a challenge that we're working with. And I think at the same time, it's a great news because we're always looking for good talent because the office is so, we're, we're doing really well as a, as a Canadian system and we definitely need to find the talent to kind of support that. So I'll say the two things. One is, you know, the two offices, we need to kind of make sure they stand up because we actually have a lot, quite a bit of business happening in those places and we're flying Toronto people out there. But as, as a system as a whole, I think we're also short of people given the growth we're having. Um, so we have one last question that we can cover. Janice, yeah. coming from the live stream. Yeah. Yeah, this is from uh, Rachel Hall. Um, more importantly, more recently, there has been an introduction of the knowledge and analytics centers and key offices in Boston and Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And do you see a PNA center being built in Toronto that focuses on some of those 
Yeah, and I think one thing you will find is that even though we have centers in like Boston in different places, we actually operate very globally as a firm. So like, you know, our knowledge centers are like usually remote. Like the media center, the media people that I work with is usually in Europe. There's a media person in Singapore and there's a media person in the US. And what I love about the fact that it's global versus it being local is that like, I basically can get requests done at any point in time, 24 hours around the clock. So like if I'm like at night and I'm like I want I need something and I'm going to go to sleep I'm going to send it to the person in Asia because when I wake up in the morning it's going to be in my inbox so it's awesome that way. Um, the other thing is Toronto actually has capabilities as well. So like with the pipe, uh, which is kind of the private equity and the investment, the investment practice area is actually based out of the Toronto office. So I would say like from a support from a knowledge base perspective. It's more of a global system than it is a local support system. Same thing with like a production support. It's a very global system as well. Um, and then I know we're out of time, but if you indulge me for one minute, I'll just cover one last thing, which is I'm really passionate about this idea of like women at BCT. And I, why I think this is relevant to this forum is because it's not really about women. And I think, it, I think it's about diversity in general. And I like this quote from a partner because it says, Humanity shouldn't miss out on half of itself. And I remember going to an international women's forum and they were talking about this with regards to STEM as well. And they were saying, if I think the quote that the person said was, if the cure in cancer lies in the head of a woman today, we may never find it, right? And I thought that was super relevant because I find that it's the same thing here in consulting. It's a problem that we face not in consulting or like any specific industry. I think the issue that we face in general that we just need people that are more diverse. And it could be diverse from a women perspective. It can be diverse from you know, a background perspective. But that's something that BCG is lo constantly looking for. Because the best ideas don't live in people who have MBAs. The best ideas don't live in men. The best ideas don't live with people who are from a certain like religious background or ethnic background or anything like that. I think the best, the best ideas come from people who are diverse and bringing them together so that we can solve problems together. So I thought I'll end with that note because that's something that's really important to me. And if you guys have questions, happy to take them, but I know we're running out of time.